Hello and welcome. Chances are that you're here because you're interested in the Steam version of Gloomhaven, but haven't played the tabletop version of the game. I'm going to try and be as direct with this tutorial as possible in order to help players understand how to play. The idea is that this will be as bare bones as possible to keep it short and get you in the game. Getting into a game is simple enough. Choose Adventure, and then choose a different party if you like, although the default party is a great starter, and then hit continue. You'll get to the map screen, and get some flavour text before being able to head off in a direction. Pay attention to the different colours, green is an easier journey, yellow is medium, and red is a hard journey. Until you're confident, I'd recommend sticking with the easy options to learn the game. Occasionally, on the way to a location, you'll have an encounter, which gives you a choice between a few options. You'll never know what each outcome will be, so choose one you feel is right for you. Once you get to a location, you'll be able to enter it to begin combat and exploration. Combat and exploration is where the bulk of the game takes place. There's a lot to take in on this screen, so I'm going to break it down before proceeding. On the left hand side of the screen, you have your party members listed here. You can see how many actions they currently have planned just below their portrait. It then shows character specifics. The character's class name, level, and list of skill cards are shown here. Each skill card in the list has an initiative value indicated by the number, and the skill name. I'll cover what initiative does shortly, so don't worry about it for now. If you move your mouse over a skill card, it will show the full details of what each one can do. Each skill card has a top action, and a bottom action. Generally speaking, top actions are attack actions, and bottom actions are movement or utility actions, but this is not always the case. In the middle of each card, you can also see the initiative and two small buttons on the left and right, which are the default actions that can be used instead of a top or bottom action. These default actions are always to attack and to move. Whilst they may not seem like a good pick when you're learning, these default skills provide you with a good option when a card's ability might cause an unwanted effect. To the left hand side of the skill list is the equipped items the character has. These items can be highlighted with the mouse to see what they do at any time. The top of the screen shows the turn order track. It shows one portrait for each different type of character. The little symbols on the enemy portraits indicate innate abilities that the monsters have. For example, the living spirit here is flying and always has a shield. I'll go into some more detail about the statuses and abilities soon. The main field is divided into hexes. Each hex can contain one character only, and can contain other objects like gold, traps and obstacles. The camera can be moved with W, A, S and D, and rotated with Q and E or the middle mouse button. You can zoom the camera in and out with the mouse wheel. Most missions will have you killing all enemies on the map, but this is not as simple as it looks. The enemies that are on screen here are not the only enemies in the dungeon, and you may need to open one or more doors to reveal the entire map. When checking rooms, be sure to pay attention to if there are doors, and if so, how many, because chances are you will need to open them all. In order to take a turn, you need to pick two skills with each controllable character. The first skill selected also determines when a character will act in turn order with its initiative. You can see that when I select the first skill on the Brute, it applies the 32 initiative to the Brute up the top of the turn tracker. Keep in mind that each card has a top and bottom action, and if you choose to use the top action of one card, you will be forced to use the bottom action of the other. You don't need to choose which side of each skill will be chosen now though, as this happens on the character's turn, which gives you some freedom to adapt to the enemy's actions. During this selection phase, you aren't able to see how fast the enemies are going to act or what they're going to do, so it's important to try and choose cards that will give you options so that you can react to what the enemies will do later. Once you've queued skills with all characters, press the End Selection button at the bottom of the screen to begin the turn. 
At this point, the enemy's planned action and initiative is also revealed. Each enemy type has its own action deck, and one action is drawn at random for each. Due to this, you will never know exactly what action an enemy will take, or how quickly they are likely to go, but after a few plays you'll be able to learn what actions they can possibly take to better prepare yourself for upcoming dangers. Once the enemy actions are drawn, you will see that the turn orders are shifted reflecting each character's initiative, and then the turns begin. In this case, the cultists get to move before my characters, but are not able to make use of their attack as they can't get into range. When it's one of your character's turns, the selected skills will appear. At this point, the player decides which actions to take in which order. Only one side of each card can be played, and again, if the top of a skill is selected, the other skill will be forced to use the bottom action. At this point, you might be wondering what all of the keywords and symbols are, so I'll cover a few, but I can't cover them all. Thankfully, if you press the escape key, you are able to go into the compendium, which is like a rules reference, and it will explain all of the individual icons. First is the keyword attack. This is an attack action. Smaller text below the attack action indicates that it is part of the attack. For example, Warding Strength will attack the enemy for 3 damage and can push the enemy up to 2 spaces away. The next main keyword is Move. In this case, my Trample card also has Jump as a property of the move. Normally, you are not able to move through enemies or objects, and must go around, but a Jump card allows you to move through obstacles and enemies and ignore traps as long as you can land safely on the final space of movement. There is a little shield with XP written on one of the skills. Skills with an XP symbol on them will earn the character using the skill XP, which will help the character level up over time. Most importantly, and I cannot stress this enough, down the bottom corner of both of my skills is a little burning card symbol. If a skill on a card has that burning symbol, it means that if that skill is used, that card will be lost, and the entire card cannot be played again for the rest of this combat. In order to avoid losing a skill early, you will notice that I choose the little boot button above the bottom action of the bottom card. This allows me to use the bottom action of this card without triggering the burn card effect. Now, the bottom action may only be a simple move too, but it's far better than losing that card early. Now that I've moved near the enemy, I can make use of the top action of the other skill and attack the enemy. When queuing the action, you can see the estimate of how much damage will be done is applied to the enemy's health bar, but this is not guaranteed to be the result. Each character in the game has an attack modifier deck. This deck is comprised of 20 cards that modify how much damage will be done during an attack. Most of the cards either simply plus or minus 1 or 2, or do no change at all. However, there is one double damage and one outright miss. One attack modifier card is drawn per attack automatically, and is briefly shown above the enemy's health bar as the attack is taking place. When an attack modifier is drawn, it is discarded and cannot come out again, so you can get a feel for which modifiers are likely to come out next by moving your mouse over each character, providing a visual representation of which cards remain. When a double damage or miss is drawn, the entire attack modifier deck is reshuffled at the end of the round, so these ones can keep coming out even if it feels as though you only just drew one. The enemies also have an attack modifier deck that is shared between each different type, so you can keep track of what is likely to come out when an enemy attacks by putting your mouse over any of them too. I got a plus zero modifier with this attack, so the attack does the base damage of three to the enemy. That's everything on attack modifiers for now. Because I used warding strength, I now have the option to push the enemy two tiles away. Pushing doesn't do any damage, but you can use it to set up enemies for later turns, or push them into traps. I've now taken both actions, and can end my character's turn. Now it's the living spirit's turn. You'll notice that this enemy can fly, which essentially means that it's permanently jumping. 
It can pass over traps, obstacles and enemies if it so chooses, but it's not in range to perform an attack this round. A quick note about enemy logic. The AI follows a relatively simple rule regarding targeting and pathing. Basically, it will find the closest enemy, and if they are tied for closest, it will go for the one with the fastest initiative. This means that you are able to protect lower health characters just by moving closer to enemies, even if your other characters are slower. Be aware that some enemies will attack multiple targets though, and this can usually be seen by examining what the enemy is going to do by putting the mouse cursor over their character model. There are also elements that can be activated and used. Some characters use these more than others. You can see the Kragheart has some extra symbols on their cards. Massive Boulder has a leaf symbol on the top action of the card. This indicates that performing this skill will infuse that element onto the battlefield at the end of that character's turn. Earthen Clod's top skill also has a leaf symbol, but it has a down arrow on it. This indicates that the skill can be augmented with the element, consuming the element from the battlefield and applying extra effects to the skill. In order to activate these elemental augments, if the element is available, press the consume element button on a skill to activate the augment and then use the skill as normal. At the end of an entire round, any elements that have been infused will wane. The element is still usable in its waned state next turn, but if a waning element is not used by the end of that round, it will become inert and will need to be infused again in order to use it to augment skills. Defeating enemies will drop gold on the ground. Gold can be picked up with a loot action, but you can also end a character's turn when they are standing on the gold and they will pick it up automatically, saving an action. Loot actions can be handy to pick up multiple gold tokens around a player in one turn, so they can be used quite effectively if you have the time to spare. When every character has had their turn, the next round will start, and you will need to choose skills for your next turn. You will notice, however, that the two skills that you used last turn are greyed out and cannot be selected this turn. After multiple turns, you will no longer have any skills to play and will need to decide whether to short or long rest. Resting is how skills are returned from the discard pile back into your hand. When resting, a skill from your discard pile will be lost for the rest of the combat, however. Which skill is lost depends on the type of rest you perform. A short rest happens instantly at the start of a turn, allowing you to choose two skills to play the turn as normal after resting. When short resting however, the skill that is lost is chosen randomly, which can be risky. A long rest has an initiative of 99. Long resting takes an entire turn, but when it becomes that character's turn, they restore 2 HP, some used equipment cards are refreshed, and they get to choose which skill they would like to lose. Long resting has a lot of advantages, but missing a turn in the middle of combat can be too punishing, often forcing you to take short rests. As a general rule, you want to avoid losing skills for as long as possible. Each lost skill removes an option from your choices, and when all skills have been lost, your character becomes exhausted, which is the same as losing all of your HP. It is more likely that you'll lose a combat because you've run out of turns than it is that you'll run out of HP. This also means that you always need to be moving and trying to progress towards the end of the dungeon, otherwise you'll run out of skills and won't be able to make it to the end. Keep in mind that you don't need to pick up every single gold drop, and even treasure chests can be skipped if you're desperate, as it's not worth the reward if you don't survive the adventure. Sometimes it may seem as though the game is behaving strangely, like a heal won't heal your character's HP, or your character won't be able to move, which may seem like a bug due to early access. I haven't seen these concerns being echoed by many people in the community, so it is more than likely that the characters were affected by debuffs. For example, if a character is poisoned, healing will remove the poison, but not restore health, and 
end, if a character is immobilized, they are unable to move. Debuffs appear below your character's health bar as a little icon. If you don't know what the icon represents, move your mouse over your character to bring up their card, and this will tell you the name of the debuff. You can then open the compendium to understand how the debuff impacts your character. I hope this video has helped you. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to get back to you. Additionally, the community on Discord is very active for this game and can answer questions extremely quickly if I don't get back to you straight away. There is also the tabletop FAQ which clarifies many rules, like enemy pathfinding for example. I've placed links to these resources in the video description below. If you feel like there's anything I've missed or skimmed over, or if you'd like to see me make a video on a different topic, let me know. Until next time, have fun adventuring.